Unistim Laya was one of the uh, centers participating in this multi-center trial. Um, it was, the primary investigator was Dr. P.J. Devereux from Canada, and the funding was from Canadian Institute of Health Research. And our lead investigator from this country was Professor Wang Chu Yin. So, um, without further Sorry, there's a little bit of uh, housekeeping. Can I announce that there will be a bit of lag time when the camera moves to our speaker, so bear with us. And the questions will have a la lag time of about 20 seconds before I see your questions. So do post your questions online. We'll be very happy to take them. So this session, we will begin with our friendly geriatrician on my right, who will present the results on heat attack. And then uh, we will have a panel discussion um, with the cardiologist and surgeon and myself, Associate Professor Dr. Lo Bui San from the anesthetic department. So without further ado, let me invite Dr. Ko Hui Ming to start her presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Lo, for the introduction. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to be able to present the results of the hip attack trial on behalf of all the hip attack investigators. So today we'll share with you about what we have learned from participating in this international trial. So this is just a bit of a background about hip fracture. So patients with hip fracture undergoing surgery have much higher mortality risk compared to patients who undergo elective total hip replacement surgery. Patients with hip fracture are likely to be older, have multiple comorbidities, and many of them also have dependency at, in at least one activities of daily living. This means that these patients are much more frail compared to those who actually undergo elective total hip replacement surgery. Hip fracture injury in itself results in pain, bleeding, and immobility. And all this actually triggers a cascade of inflammation, hypercoagulability state. And actually, because of all this stress response, it actually precipitates medical complication to occur in these patients. Hence, the delay in surgery, which actually increases the duration of these patients in this negative physiology stressor, is, is actually not uh, good in terms of their outcome. In many different countries, early surgery is shown to be associated with lower mortality and major complication risks. And when we talk about early surgery, the time frame is within 24 to 48 hours of presentation with hip fracture. There is no exact definite time that is most suitable, but we find that anything beyond 72 hours is associated with poorer outcome. Hence, the hip attack intends to determine whether accelerated surgery, which means surgery in less than 24 hours for hip fracture patient to see if it's superior to standard care in reducing death and major complication risk. This is a bit like an analogy for patients with acute MI and acute stroke, where early and quick intervention actually confers better benefit outcome. And we, find, we want to find whether these patients with hip fracture, if you reverse these uh, negative physiology state, whether it confers better outcome as well. So the hip attack is a randomized controlled trial. Patients aged 45 and above with low trauma hip fracture are eligible to be included in the trial. Patients with, uh, who takes therapeutic anticoagulant, which does not have a reversal agent, are being excluded, as well as patients with periprosthetic fractures, open fractures, bilateral fractures are excluded. Patients who require more emergency surgery for another reason are also excluded in this trial. So once patients are recruited, they are randomized to either accelerated surgery, which means ultra early surgery within six hours of hip fracture diagnosis or to standard care, which means operation within less than 48 hours of presentation. To me, it's still a win-win situation where if you look at in Malaysia, most hip fracture are operated within five to seven days in most public hospital setting and sometimes even longer in other hospitals. So you can imagine to do this trial, these patients are being 
cleared medically to be able to go for surgery, consented as well as having to pay for the implant or on their arrival to emergency department prior to randomization. The primary outcomes that we look at are 90 days follow up in terms of all cause mortality, as well as major perioperative complications, which include the composite of mortality, non fatal MI, venous thromboembolism, pneumonia, sepsis, stroke, life threatening, or major bleeding. The Hepatech trial started recruitment in 2014 and uh, University of Malaya started their first recruitment in 2016. A total of close to 3,000 patients were randomized in 69 centers over 17 countries. So this is the results of the trial. So uh, you can, as you can see, the average age of patients that participated in this trial are elderly, close to 80 years old of age and mostly women, as with most hip fracture patients present as. And if you look at the medical history, about a third of these patients have some uh, require some assistance with their activities of daily living. A quarter of them were actually nursing home residents and also ha have a diagnosis of dementia. This is the type of hip fractures that they present with. Majority of them were intertrochantric fractures, uh, followed by neck of femur fracture and a small proportion of subtrochantric fractures. So the types of surgery performed, as you can imagine, as most of them were intertrochantric fracture, hence uh, open reduction and internal fixation was uh, the, the highest predominance of surgery performed. And in terms of arthroplasty, uh, most of them underwent hemi-arthroplasty and only a very small proportion had total hip replacement. This is the uh, median time to surgery for accelerated arm. It's within six hours as per the trial. And in terms of standard arm, most patients were operated within 24 hours of diagnosis. So this is what we waited for, for during the duration of the trial, the outcomes. Uh, there was no difference between mortality or composite of major complication in both arms, as you can see on this slide. However, we'll go into a little bit more detail of what we find in these patients. So these are the secondary outcome measures that we looked at in uh, conditions that occurred post randomization. There was no difference between the two arms in terms of vascular or non-vascular mortality. And in the other conditions such as myocardial infarction, congestive heart failure, new onset atrial fibrillation, thrombovenous embolism or bleeding, pressure ulcer, pneumonia, there was no difference between the two arms. But when you look at in terms of infection as a whole, Patients with the accelerated care arm had fewer, uh, fewer infections without sepsis and the incidence of delirium in patients on the arm. So if we look into more detail into the types of infection, patients in the accelerated care arm had fewer incidences of urinary tract infection. But if you look at the other types of infection, they, there is no uh, significant difference between the two arms. This is in terms of uh, orthopedic surgery complication outcomes. There was no difference between the two arms. And you could also see that even despite accelerated surgery, there was no uh, incidences of uh, uh, complications in terms of the orthopedic surgery. This is to look at the time from randomization to mobility in a patient post hip fracture. In the accelerated care arm, patients were mobilized much quicker compared to the standard arm. Whether is it mobilized to the side of the bed, whether is it time to first standing post operation or even full weight bearing. I just want to highlight that despite whether is it accelerated or standard care arm, these patients were actually mobilized fairly quickly, at least within 72 hours of randomization. 
this is in terms of the length of stay. Patients in the accelerated care arm goes home much earlier compared to the standard arm. And if you look at the pain scores, we find that patients on the accelerated care arm report less moderate to severe pain scores from day four to seven post randomization compared to those in the standard care arm. This is to look at subgroup analysis uh, of patients in terms of 90 days mortality, dividing them into the different in terms of the time from fracture to hospital arrival. There is no difference uh, within whether they've presented in less than four hours or four to 24 hours or even more than 24 hours. There's no difference in terms of mortality outcomes. But if you look at a 90 days major complication, there is a significant difference where patients as, as the, the hazard ratio actually decreases as the time increases. So it tells you that even if they present late following a fall and comes to hospital, make even uh, more than 24 hours, accelerated surgery actually has a better outcome. And uh, this is an analysis where you, we look at uh, the different medical conditions that the patient comes in on presentation, specifically looking at patients with raised troponin level before randomization. And these patients, even with raised troponin level, uh, 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 the outcome actually favors accelerated care with reduced mortality. And nearly it also shows a reduction in major complications in 90 days. So it gives me now to share with you a little bit about our Malaysia subgroup. So in terms of in Malaysia, the recruitment is done in two centers. We had a total of 60 patients contributing to the whole trial and University of Malaya itself, we recruited 79 patients. The other center was Hospital uh, Penang, led by uh, Dr. Li Ming Li. And if you look at our Malaysian subgroup, the age is approximately in their late 70s, majority women, and about a third of our patients has dementia. Our time to surgery, uh, in, even in the standard care arm, was less than 48 hours. Our length of stay is close to about a week and we had four mortality in total. One of these patients actually passed away prior to surgery, and uh, our percentage of mortality is actually consistent with the results of the trial as well. This is the steering committee of the hip attack trial uh, in Malaysia. Our PI, uh, Professor Wang Chiu Yin, has done a lot of hard work even from getting ethics clearance all the way to patient recruitment and follow up. We would like to thank her for her leadership and also thank uh, the, the, the host of a multidisciplinary team in making this trial a success. So what is the conclusion that we get from this trial? We do believe that, you know, patients with hip fracture accelerated surgery, yes, it did not show significant lower risk of mortality or composite of major complications. However, one of the take home message is that there is no evidence of harm, even in subgroups with acute medical condition, especially those with raised troponin level. And in accelerated surgery as demonstrated that these patients have lower risk of delirium, UTI, they report lesser uh, uh, moderate to severe pain scores from day four to seven post randomization. These patients were able to mobilize quicker. They were able to uh, uh, re uh, return to full standing and full weight bearing earlier than patients on the standard care arm. And they also stay in the hospital shorter. Uh, the accelerated surgery demonstrated mortality advantage in patients with elevated troponin before randomization. So I think the implication for us is to note that accelerated surgery for hip fracture is safe and it is feasible like we've presented. However, there is always going to be a balance between the logistic and resources required for accelerated surgery to be performed in different centers. And with this, I would just like to highlight that the uh, trial was published and uh, you could actually assess it currently. And that brings me to the end of my talk and I pass the time back to Prof Lo. Thank you very much for an excellent presentation, uh, Huimin. 
um, just allow me to summarize. Um, I think this huge trial on hip fractures um, in in the world and also the results uh, in Malaysia has shown that we've got very good uh, points in perioperative care of these frail elderly uh, patients who come to our hospital with a hip fracture. Suddenly we can learn from this trial and adapt it to our clinical practice. So I'm going to start the panel discussion with our um, orthopedics side. Uh, let's hear it from our trauma surgeon, Dr. C.S. Kumar. Um, can I find out what is the frequency of hip fractures that we are dealing with in our local institution here or even in Malaysia? Okay, very good morning to all the viewers. Uh, I'm Dr. Kumar from the Department of Orthopedic Surgery. Uh, pertaining to your question regarding the frequency, uh, we, we have to understand that we live in Petaling Jaya. It is probably a very matured neighborhood. And uh, we do see considerable number of patients coming in, but on average, we are looking anything between five to eight cases per week. And uh, having said that, this is sometimes uh, it's also seasonal. We have seen as high as uh, 10 uh, cases per week and uh, to sometimes not even a single case uh, in a week. Like I say, it can be seasonal sometimes. Yeah. Right, let's, um, Dr. C.S. Kumar, shall we move on to a bit more challenging uh, discussion? What is the biggest challenge actually in this, um, in, in deal, basically in treating hip fractures, whether it's in our own institution or other institutions and in our general population? And, um, and, and lastly, um, a question posted is, how do we adapt this hip attack results to our clinical practice? How do we put it into practice? Yeah. Uh, coming back to your uh, question, we're talking about challenges. Uh, number one, unlike many other countries, uh, we do live in a multiracial country. So it is very important for the treating doctors to understand the various culture. I think we are gifted in that way, being in Malaysia. And, uh, you know, consent taking can be quite challenging. Now, first of all, uh, we try to make them understand about the study itself. And uh, we do get positive response from uh, family members that, uh, you know, when you come in with a fracture and uh, you actually get it done within six hours, uh, that is something quite amazing as far as the standards of uh, hip fracture care is concerned. Now, next thing is that uh, we do have variety of uh, implants available, but when, to, when patients come in, uh, say, late nights and having them to purchase these implants at the late hours, so we do talk about issues with finance. And... Uh, Next thing is uh, when the patients come in, getting the entire team in uh, at one go. Uh, thanks to technology these days, it can work as uh, easy as in WhatsApp. But, you know, at some occasions, not everybody is available at all times. But nevertheless, we, we managed. We managed. Uh, we didn't have uh, any big issues uh, for us to say about, uh, all small minor issues. And... Uh, Having that, you know, uh, we started sort of missing this hip attack trial once uh, it ended, the trial ended and, you know, so suddenly there was a, as if like it was a quiet period of time. Then, uh, so what we did was we have already adapted what's called as a fracture liaison service, where we try our best to get the hip fractures to be done within this uh, 48 hours. And uh, until today, it is still going on. Uh, it is even practiced in many other hospitals. So that's the way that we're actually adapting to the service now. Thank you very much. Um, and, and I do agree with uh, Dr. Kumar uh, about the, um, the want or need of these patients and their relatives. Uh, in the study, it's also uh, published in the results that less than 5% of patients who were approached for consent in this multi-center trial actually agreed to part, uh, this less than 5% actually refused to consent. Um, so it, hence it, they came to a conclusion on the discussion that um, actually patients themselves and their relatives would like to have a chance for accelerated surgery. 
Um, next, I'm going to bring our cardiologist, Prof Chi, into the discussion. Now, um, in the study, um, we explained how the fast track or accelerated arm patients were given an expedited um, medical clearance in roughly an average of about three hours. Um, can Prof Chi comment on that about uh, how do we expedite medical clearance? Hi, thanks. Um, firstly, I think in hip attack uh, study, we are definitely dealing with a pretty high risk group of patients. Um, in essence, their average age is about 79 years old, which is very, very old. 60% or so actually have hypertension and uh, one third of them actually depends on their family member to actually assist them. So we are actually dealing with a high risk group of patients. And yet, as you can see from the hip attack result, we actually get very, very good result. Patient did very, very well, especially in the accelerated pathway. So that comes to the question, how do you actually assess this group of patients, this group of very high risk patients uh, who actually should go for an early and accelerated uh, hip replacement uh, after a hip fracture? I think what we have done uh, based on our experience in University of Malaya, I think firstly, history taking a physical examination is definitely important. Uh, the geriatrician have actually contributed a lot in actually getting the history and the physical examination. I think this is still provide the baseline of how we assess the risk of the patient. Uh, simple things, for example, if the patient is on some form of anticoagulant with no reversal agent, definitely will be excluded. So these are the few things that you actually exclude from the high, uh, from this group of patients. Now, after that, what we actually have done in New Steam layer is that we didn't actually go all out and get an angiogram or get an echocardiogram, for example. I think we just actually just did a very, very simple 12 lead ECG. And we actually use the technology of what uh, using WhatsApp actually to share with the group and actually have a quick look whether the ECG actually shows any uh, significant serious precondition that we should exclude the patient. So I think most of the time, I think the ECG actually tell us quite a lot of information and we don't actually need to exclude the patient and the patient actually proceed on with the operation, either the accelerated pathway or the standard pathway. You may felt that whether this is adequate, but I think the hip attack study have actually shown very elegantly. I taking physical exam medication and a simple uh, will be able to do the trick and did not put the patient in harm. So I think that should be the way to go. And I think I'm glad to hear that we are actually having some form of a hip fracture liaison with the orthopedic, and I hope. We should sort of continue what we have done uh, so good with the hip attack study uh, to bring benefit to our patient. Yeah, um, wonderful. Uh, I think it's really important to have uh, um, the whole team working together and uh, also a senior uh, consultant uh, advising us. Um, I remember the times when we had something that was quite equivocal, um, but we all had a good discussion and decided to carry on with a recruited patient. Um, another question for Prof Chi. I know um, there is another subgroup in this study that was uh, uh, described as having high troponin on presentation. Now, although the the actual analysis or sub analysis has not been published yet, um, but could you kindly comment about these patients who are actually at high risk from the start? Yeah, I think these are very interesting uh, findings. Uh, but um, before I go into details of the subgroup analysis, please be careful that this is a, a, just a subgroup. It's nice to generate a lot of hypotheses, but I think um, whether you can come to the conclusion and change our practice, I think we should be very cautious about it. Now, what we actually have seen in the hip attack study is that we actually divided the group into two. One actually have baseline troponin elevation and the other group has no elevation or troponin at baseline. If you think about it logically, those patients who actually have elevated troponin, they will not do well, you see. They should, because they already have myocardial damage, they should actually have a much higher mortality and by logic, 
you would actually have sort of slow a uh, slow down the operation let's assess the patient carefully uh, let's do maybe some further cardiac investigation before we subject the patient for operation and yet what the hip attack study actually show those patients who have elevated troponin at baseline that means before they actually go into the theater the troponin has already elevated this group of patients actually did very, very well with accelerated pathway. In fact, their mortality at 90 days was actually dropped about 62% compared with the standard pathway. In other words, those patients with baseline troponin did very, very well as far as mortality is concerned at 90 days with the accelerated pathway. Now, what could be the reason with that? Well, one possible reason is that because the troponin has already elevated, that means that the patient may not be sort of already very stressed out from the fracture and all that. So they're already a little bit like decompensated as far as cardiolo cardiology side of things are. So if you can actually fix it quickly, fix the fracture quickly, they are the one who actually did very well because once you actually have fix a fracture then all the rehabilitation all the therapy can be started as quickly as possible so that could be the one um, explanation but i think the subgroup was pretty, pretty small is i think it's only like um 10 percent or so of the total population so i think we need to be cautious i think still back to what i have said just now assess the patient properly go through the history and physical examination and then look at the ECG, listen to the story of the patient, and then decide whether this patient should go for accelerated pathway or standard pathway. Thank you, um, Prof Chi, and I agree that we should look into this subgroup and we wait for the results of the, the analysis. Um, last but not least, I think um, I will speak from the anesthetic point of view as the last piece in the puzzle. Um, I think I cannot emphasize more on teamwork in perioperative care of this patient. Um, I think teamwork, teamwork, teamwork is very important. Um, and uh, it's, it's a tough start, I would say. When we started doing this trial, it was a tough start. Um, there were a lot of things to smoothen and then eventually it got better to be a seamless approach in the uh, management of these patients. Um, and I think in University of Malaya, um, we've also got uh, a dedicated trauma theater, which, which runs for 24 hours. So I think this is important to recognize that there are patients or, that are both emergency, semi-emergency, and also elective. And these patients should also be given priority um, in, in the trauma list of an institution. Um, I think certain countries, they have an entire bundle, like a hip care program, and I think uh, it will be a start of a good program, such as uh, what Dr. C. S. Kuma has mentioned. Uh, it will involve all our teams together and improve the palliative care of these patients. So last, but uh, um, lastly, I'd like to summarize what uh, Dr. Ko has actually presented. Uh, in the results of hip attack. Uh, no doubt it didn't give the answers to everything, but there were some very good points to, to remember. It has been shown if the patients with hip fractures are treated uh, and managed in, uh, with, uh, in, in uh, surgically in an accelerated group and on an average of six hours, um, there is a lower risk of delirium um, infection, especially urinary tract infection. Um, less pain in the subsequent days, so hence leading to early mobilization and eventual early discharge of this patient. Um, right, there, there is a posted question to all of us in, in the group, uh, especially, no, this is a question to Professor Chi. Um, the audience has posted a question, how high were the troponin levels in this group? Can Prof Chi take this question before? So the question is actually is what is the um, troponin levels in the HIP study, um, HIP attack study? I, uh, 
the I don't think the current full paper actually have the troponin level, uh, but I think what it means actually in the paper is that they actually use their own uh, center troponin assay. So once they actually above their normal range, they are considered being elevated uh, troponin in the study. So as far as the exact um, level of troponin and also what kind of assay was used, I think this will await the sort of the another subgroup analysis paper that supposed to be published pretty soon. So once we have that, uh, we are more than happy to answer that question. Yeah. Right, there's a second question from the audience. Um, are there plans in future to study whether frailer pa patients also benefit from accelerated surgery? Perhaps we'll hear it from the geriatrician, uh, Dr. Ko. Thank you very much. That's like a one million question. So uh, what we find from the study is that frail patients do benefit from accelerated surgery. It was a shame that the uh, study did not show a reduction in mortality or a major composite complication. But what we find is that there was no harm and these patients really had better secondary outcomes like what uh, Prof Lo said lesser risk of delirium, UTI, they mobilize quicker, they have less pain and they can go back earlier. And I think these are important for frail patients. As in whether in University of Malaya, we could ensure that our frail patients also benefit from accelerated surgery. I would think that even if we could put our standard towards operation within 48 hours or lesser, it already show concur ben benefit to it. Now. So I think we're working towards it like uh, what you can see here. Caring for patients with hip fracture is not a one man show. It requires a host of different teams being involved. The system itself needs to be in place to ensure these patients not only just get to surgery early, but also post surgical care. So looking at rehabilitation and bone health protection and all the rest that comes after the operation is also important. I think, uh, wait for the spot, we will be planning on different things in the future to ensure these patients get better care. Yes, correct, I agree. But I think a very important person is the surgeon who repairs the fracture. So can we hear it from Dr. C.S. Kumar? Uh, yes, uh, okay, regarding uh, the question that was asked, are there any plans uh, in the future to study whether frailer, when you talk about frailer patients, uh, first and foremost, I guess it's not only among the doctors, the public and everybody need to understand one particular important matter. I would like to use this platform to send a message out. Now, first of all, when patients come in, we have issues. Uh, I'm talking based on about 20 years of experience dealing with uh, patients and relatives who have hip fractures. One of their favorite questions is actually, they are so old, do you really need to do surgery for them? Now, uh, this is a very interesting question that's been, uh, I literally face every week and uh, more or less I have the same answer to everyone and uh, saying uh, number one is that neither the family members nor the doctors should try and play God. Uh, do not try to decide whether uh, if we do the surgery, uh, they might, uh, you know, pass on and things like that. It is, it is not for us to decide. I've always given an example of uh, we orthopedic surgeons being in a being a mechanic in a tire shop. So when uh, the patient, in this case the tire, uh, it is actually punctured or damaged when it's brought to your shop, uh, your job is actually to change the tire to a new one or mend the repair or whatever. It is not the duty of the mechanic to actually comment about the color of the car, whether the seat is right, uh, the steering wheel is not in appropriate position. Uh, that, that is uh, not the duty of the mechanic. It's just like that. It is not our job or duty to decide whether they should live or die. I think uh, coming to the cardiologist, he's got his job to do. So he's doing his job. The geriatrician got their job to do, the anesthetist. So when we combine this together, the outcome has always been better. And having said frailer patients, uh, I think the record that we have uh, uh, me being uh, have have done uh, 
uh, a patient who's 105 years old. My colleague, Dr. Srimbad, has done 102. Sometimes we keep a challenge as to who gets the older patient. Um, so having uh, surgery done for patients who are 80s and 90s is totally possible these days. And it is really a joy uh, from the orthopedic surgeon or from the operating team and even the rest of the team to see patients who have been brought in just the day before in a stretcher. And, uh, you know, two days later, they're actually up about walking, at least in a walking frame. It's a joy that we see. We enjoy what we do and we hope to continue this under the name of Fracture Lives on Service. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I agree um, with Dr. C.S. Kumar with my whole heart. Uh, and uh, don't forget the um, the anesthetist, the one who agrees to take the patient into your workshop, uh, Dr. Kumar. Um, we all work as a team and it has to be a very positive relationship uh, uh, in the care of these patients. Um, and we all know it may be difficult, but, uh, but uh, these patients deserve the best. Um, with the interest of time, I think we conclude our panel discussion and presentation of this uh, large trial, hip attack. Um, I wish everyone well. Um, go and have a real breakfast now. And thank you very much to the panel and our speaker of today. Have a good day.